I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we you need you on the internet wherever and whenever you are my name is Joe DeMar, and you have been lucky enough to tune into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we like to do it with a little bit of humor, and we like to do it with a, an upbeat attitude, hence the name For a Green Future, because we do believe that we have a green future. We have a really good show lined up for you today. The, today is the last show of 2020, which um, I know a lot of people are, are happy to see 2020 going away. Uh, but we have a, a really good show. Last week you might have heard that we I was talking a little bit about a movie called Radium Girls. And I was actually lucky enough this week to go ahead and get an interview with the directors of that movie. So uh, we're going to, we have a recording. We're going to hear that in a little bit, probably about quarter after. But yeah, the first time on this, it's a sh first for the show where we actually get to, to interview some, some big time movie directors, which is, which was kind of a thrill. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, let's see. So then, of course, after that, we will be hearing from our sponsors and patrons, our wonderful people who and uh, companies that make this show possible. Rebecca Wood will be joining us after the bottom of the hour. She's got some fascinating information about reindeer. And then uh, we'll have our eco news and views, some big news on a lot of issues this this week. And, of course, our, our final letter from the future you know if you're a regular listener you know we've been getting letters from our my great great granddaughter Marie I calling from the year uh, 2300 and uh, this this is her last letter to us this time so we're looking forward to that we are on the air I just got confirmation that you can actually hear me <laughs> and that's always good when you're on the radio and your audience can actually hear you and uh, I, we would like to hear you, too. So uh, if you want to call in at any time during this hour at 866-240-1065, that's 866-240-1065, we would be happy to talk to you about any environmental news or topic. And, in fact, uh, I have a question for you if you want to answer it, and that is what was your biggest, your own personal biggest environmental story of 2020? That is, what did you learn about the environment or what did you find out in an ecological story that that really uh, caught your attention in this past year? And there's a lot to choose from, so I'm, I'm just curious what was your biggest. It, but as I say, you can call us at any time during this hour at 866-240-1065 on any environmental topic, and we will uh, happily take your call. And... Uh, as you know, if you've been listening for the past couple of weeks, we are, uh, well, I am right now broadcasting from uh, the Boston, Massachusetts area. And I'm, I'm looking out my window right now and I can see Boston Harbor. It's actually a beautiful sunny day here, although it's uh, kind of cold. And so I've been learning a lot. I've been looking, observing the, the environment around here and uh, we've been going for pretty regular walks on the beach here in the Boston area, and they've got a lot of beautiful beaches. And I did, my wife and I found something on the beach, which led me to find out some more environmental stuff that I, I did not know. And what we found, we found this uh, portion of a, f a fish, and it was a really big piece of a fish. And I, it was uh, cleanly cut at either end, so it was obviously, it was not natural. It wasn't like it had been bitten by a shark or something. It was clearly it had been cut by a saw because only humans make cuts that clean. And it was sort of the tail end of the fish, not including the tail itself, 
just that last little bit. And I couldn't figure out what kind of fish it was because it had this little row of fins that I I was like, what kind of fish has that? And I, I didn't realize it, so I looked it up. And what we were seeing was a, a piece of a bluefin tuna. And bluefin tuna are these amazing animals. They're the, they're top predators in the ocean. They're you know they're they're equivalent roughly on a, a terrestrial ecosystem on an earth you know a dry land ecosystem. They're a kind of equivalent to wolves in that they they hunt together as a pack, and uh, nothing really preys on them. But they eat a, a wide variety of stuff, including things like fish and squid and shellfish and even plankton. But it turns out that, uh, yeah, and they can grow to be 14 feet long and about 2,000 pounds. So uh, the fish I saw, the part of the fish we saw wasn't an adult fish. Uh, and it takes them a number of years, something like eight years, before they can uh, start reproducing. Uh, the fish we saw was, wasn't anywhere near 14. The section that was probably about a four or five foot uh, bluefin tuna, which is... Uh, really a, a young tuna and th they can also swim up to 40 miles an hour which is just an incredible rate of speed i guess in that little row of fins that i saw that confused me so much they could actually retract those when they got to want to go really fast and one more fact about bluefin tuna they are uh, warm-blooded like us i mean we we all learned in biology class that fish are cold-blooded well not tuna Tuna are actually a warm-blooded uh, fish, which is very unusual. So they're this cool, unique kind of fish. And, you know, in the research, when I was trying to figure out what kind of fish this was, and once I found out it was a bluefin tuna, I realized that this is actually a, so, something we all need to know about because uh, bluefin tuna are in the process of being hunted to extinction, unfortunately. Uh, there's there was a big brouhaha uh, a number of years ago, and uh, they started regulating the fish fishing, quote unquote, regulating the fishing. But the fishing regulation under the Trump administration, as you may well um, imagine, uh, <laughs> looks an awful lot like deregulation. I mean, what they did is they they did set pound limits on the number of tuna that can be taken. But there's uh, two big problems with that. And uh, the biggest pro thing that they say, uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna is a smart seafood choice because it is sustainably managed under a rebuilding program that allows limited harvest by U.S. fishermen, which sounds great. Except right underneath that, then they say population level. The population level is unknown for bluefin tuna in the Western Atlantic. <laughs> so you can't regulate a species effectively um, if you have hi, no idea how many of them are left you know and one thing that the Trump administration did in 2020 that I, I actually missed I'm sorry I didn't report this earlier but scientists following the tuna figured out that they do all their spawning in this one little section of the Gulf of Mexico and so as of 2015 they said no more fishing for tuna in that section of Gulf of Mexico. In fact, no more fishing in that section uh, in order to ensure the survival of the species. And there was anecdotal evidence that's not, you know, not firm scientific evidence, but anecdotal evidence that the population started growing again after they banned fishing in the spawning area uh, from 2015 until this year. And then the Trump administration said, wait, a, a rebounding wild population? We, we can't have that. So they opened the area to fishing again. <laughs> so uh, bluefin tuna, even though there's an international organization which is supposed to be regulating it, uh, and they, unfortunately, they only listen to the tuna fishing industry when they set their numbers. And even though there's a federal government uh, agency, an OAA, which is supposed to be regulating fishing, they are taking wild guesses at how many fish there are, and pretty much every independent organization, every environmental organization uh, that is 
has bio, fish biologists on it are saying we're taking way too much. We're going to crash the species. Uh, these numbers are wrong. So uh, we have this is kind of similar to what we had back with the buffalo in Yellowstone. We were talking about that a few weeks ago, where that the federal agency charged with protecting the species is actually setting limits that uh, eliminate the species. And one another, one other aspect of it that isn't talked about is that uh, there's an illegal catch. There's the black market because the bluefin tuna have become so rare that they have become incredibly expensive. They, they fish, you know, especially sushi restaurants pay incredible amounts of money for individual fish, hundreds of thousands of dollars per fish. And so there's a black market, and that's estimated, again, a guess, to be twice what the the legal catch is. And so um, it's not looking good for the bluefin tuna. So if you see it anywhere, if you see bluefin tuna for sale, don't buy it and harangue whoever's trying to sell it to you because it's not, despite the assurances of the agencies which are supposed to be protecting it, it's actually being fished into extinction. And... So this all worked back to the explanation for what we saw there on the beach here in uh, Massachusetts. And what happens is this: they, the regulation that there is is based strictly on the number of pounds of tuna taken. And this section of the tuna that was cut is mostly backbone and, so, and not a lot of actual tuna meat on it. And so what happens is that if you're fishing for tuna and you want to catch as many tuna as you can with as much pounds of tuna meat on it, if you discard this little section in the back, uh, now what's left is mostly meat. And so so that's what happens is, is more actual tuna get taken because the limit is based on pounds of fish taken. And so uh, sad situation with a, a fantastic species which must not be allowed to perish from the North Atlantic but or the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, the, the ones that are spawning in the Gulf are the ones that are feeding off the coast of Massachusetts here. They swim incredible amounts. So, so government regulation gone awry, but this is what happens when you allow the exploitive industry to set the rules. <laughs> and this is not the first time in American history by any means where that uh, experiment has tr been tried and is failing and has failed. I mean, over and over again, whenever an industry gets its hands on and gets control of a regulatory agency, immediately the, whatever the problems the agency was created there to stop, those problems show up and, and start uh, affecting things. And, and with fish and with the tuna, it's crashing of the population the agencies were supposed to prevent the crash now the crash is happening but we have lots of historical examples and as you recall last week I was talking about a new movie that's out called Radium Girls and we kind of have had the same situation back in the in the 1920s not the 2020s where uh, the, an age where the government wasn't protecting the people the government was actually on the side of the industry, and so they weren't um, they weren't protecting the people with any kind of reg regulations, and so uh, it's an incredible story, and I, I really recommend that people watch this movie. And I was lucky enough to get an interview with the directors of the movie this past week, and it's a recorded interview. It's ready to go. And uh, Jim, are, are are we set? Can you go ahead and play that? Um, hi, welcome to For a Green Future. Uh, if you could just introduce yourselves, let our listeners know who you are. I'm Lydia Dean Kilcher, and I'm the producer and co-director of Radium Girls, based here in Brooklyn, New York. And I am Jenny Moeller. I am the co-director and writer of Radium Girls. Great. Okay, so what made you uh, choose this story to tell? Well, you know, back this is this is Jenny. Back back in 2012, I was working as an archival researcher on a documentary about the Manhattan Project. And in the course of my research, I stumbled across a obscure reference to the Radium Girls, and and it was referred to as um, 
they said we all, we all remembered um, the tragic dial painters of World War One, and I was curious, and I, I looked it up, and I found a Wikipedia page about the Radium Girls, and the more I, I read, the more compelled I was, and I couldn't believe I hadn't heard the story before, and I turned to my co-worker and writing partner, Brittany Shaw, and we couldn't believe it wasn't a movie yet, and so we decided to write a screenplay. Uh huh. Yeah, it is an, an amazing story that uh, that really, at the time, gripped the whole nation. It's really quite dramatic. Uh, you folks paid a lot of attention to detail in the movie, costumes, technology, and so forth. Was it challenging to do a period piece? Well, we were an independent film, and we had been largely grant funded, and then it was a, a wonderful pool of equity investors, of female Broadway producers who were very interested in the story. So we, we did head out of the gate on a modest budget, but we found an amazing place to film in upstate New York. It's called the Weawaka Center for Women, and it's um, a Victorian estate that was donated to the factory women of Glens Falls by an heiress in, in the very period of our story. And it felt like an ideal place to go center our production, which was um, essentially set in a very uh, volatile period of industrialization, of the jazz age, of political tumult, and um, and yet it was in set in Orange, New Jersey, which is where the Radium Girls court case happened and where the um, Radium factory was based. And right across the river was New York City. Um, so we, we thought a lot about, you know, how to really, you know, find the locations that would help us tell the story um, with, you know, with an inherent backdrop. And then we brought, you know, brought period cards and costumes and hairstyles and all of that to it. Oh, yeah, well, you did. You did a great job. Um, and now you kind of touched on my next question. There's, there's a lot of stuff in this movie, a lot of contemporaneous social issues like uh, the socialist and communist movements, protests against pr police brutality, etc. How much of the political journey that the heroine goes through in your movie was factual and how much of it was telling the story of the time? Well, you know, we, we always wanted the film to be about the experience of two teenagers having their worlds turned upside down, which is what happened when the radium workers found out that they were poisoned, and, and many of them were teenage girls, and our, our main characters are composites of real radium factory workers. And one of the things that we, we wanted to explore was, you know, with our, our protagonist, Bessie, not only how does, how, how does her journey in uncovering the what's happening with the radium factory and the fact that the radium company knew that it was toxic and deadly and kept using the substance and having their workers lick the paintbrushes to get a, a fine tip ingesting their poisonous radium. That's, that's one big revelation and, and, you know, coming of age for her. And then what we wanted to do is, is say, but you know, that's not it. And, and look at the wider world of the 1920s. So her, her journey is an imagined one in that, in that sense where it is how, how, would, how would her awareness of, of the, the radium duplicity and corruption then impact the way that she engages and, and starts looking at what's happening? Because in the beginning of the film, she is, looking at Hollywood and the silver screen and and the glamour and wants to be famous in that world and wants to be part of that world and, and you know there's a, a moment when when she's saying that and she's at um, you know her first gathering of communists where <laughs> you know at, at the, she thinks she's being invited to a party and that's a party meeting that she's not invited to and and um she's confronted with the fact that there are other movies being made and they are documentaries and they are filming the many injustices that are happening in the 1920s. And so that was really important for, for her arc and journey as a character. Uh, well, I think a really good meeting is kind of indistinguishable from a party personally, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, well, so the the rate what the radium girls went through was physically was uh, horrific, and you captured some of that with the the bathroom scene and the jawbone, but some of the truly terrible things that happened to their bodies, like faces collapsing and bones literally glowing in the dark, you, you kind of we didn't really get to graphically see that. Was was this an aesthetic decision, or was it more? A function of being an independent production without the huge effects budget. Oh no, I, I think I think it's completely um, a conscious creative choice. I, you know, there is a sequence toward the end when there are radium girls from other factories because there were many factories. There was a significant one in Ottawa, Illinois. There was Waterbury, Connecticut, and there were also luminous watch dial factories in Walton, Massachusetts, and even in places like Georgia and Toronto. And these girls in other factories were becoming aware of the radium, what the radium girls in Orange, New Jersey were doing because it had really hit a national radar. And the way it had hit a national radar was that there were activist women in the New Jersey area, particularly Catherine Wiley, who's played by Kara Seymour in the movie, who was head of the New Jersey Consumers League, had connections with people like Alice Hamilton, who was a physician and a, and a pioneer in industrial toxicology, who was connected to Jane Addams at Whole House, who was connected to the League of Women Voters in New Jersey, all of who these women had just gotten the right to vote, and they wanted to use it. And they were really looking at this wild west of industrial relation where, where there was no, no regulation, you know, not for child labor, not for toxic chemicals. I mean, it was a wide open field that needed to be wrestled to the ground and they were dealing with big corporate powers. So I think, you know, for Ginny and I, this, this was really a big, big part of the story. What happened to the radium girls with, you know, women were, um, we're having all of these different kinds of symptoms and ailments and cancers and um, necroses because of the radium poisoning. And we indicate it in a sequence when they're writing letters to the radium girls saying, thank you for fighting for us. Thank you for, and this is what, and this is what is happening to me. And so we, we wanted to indicate all of those horrific things in that way. Every time a girl, you see a girl in the factory put that brush in her mouth. I mean, the audience, people in the audience tell us they just cringe. They just emotionally feel what's happening. I think that that is really what you need to see and what you need to know to really sort of experience that sort of emotional immersion of, of what's going on. But the, but the significance of the early women's political movement is really important because ultimately what we want to come across in the story is that these young girls who really were innocent at the beginning of the story, they had dreams of going to Hollywood, dreams of becoming an archaeologist. They, they went through this coming of age and they were lifted up on the shoulders of these activist women who enlisted the media, brought it to a national story. And it's the power, it's the power of using your voice. And I think that we, you know, Ginny and I have come to sort of really see the Radium Girls as the whistleblowers of their time. And that's the important part of the story. That's the parallel that we see, and so many journalists have seen in, in terms of relating it to what we're going through today, even with COVID. You know, it's this element that we don't know everything about. It's a virus we don't know everything about. People are denying science. Governments are looking a different way. You know, corporate powers are worried about their bottom line and economies are collapsing. And is it safe to go back to work while people are dying? These, these parallels, the, the minute that our movie was released, were being drawn in a, in a really, truly amazing way. I mean, when Jenny and I started making the movie, we were talking about, you know, what about the water in Flint? You know, what about yeah. all of these other things in our environment? But what we're really, where you really get at it is sort of where the power is in our culture and our economy and our political world. Yeah, I, I think one thing that really kind of strikes you when you watch the movie is that this corporation, the Radium, uh, American Radium Corporation, the, the techniques they're using and the, the denial of, of science and reality, it's the same playbook that's being used today. Yeah, no, it, it, no it's true. It's, um, we've done a couple of um, panels and talks with Elizabeth Sutherland, who was 
uh, for 30 years was a senior official in the EPA. And um, she said that a lot of people look toward Big Tobacco as the playbook. She, but she said Radium Girls really was the playbook that Big Tobacco used. And it's, um, it's this way of misleading the public away from things that are very dangerous to your health. Yeah. Well, you kind of hit, hit my next question, which was uh, what, what do you hope people gain from watching this movie? Um, do, do you want to take a, a shot at that question? Uh, like Jenny, you always say it best. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that the film is, is more relevant to today than I would hope. You know, I think, I think it says a lot about what does it mean to, to trust um, what does it mean to trust an institution that, you know, health is their priority? And then what does it mean when you start to question and, and to look? And I think, I think there's both the very uplifting, hopeful note that look at what teenagers have been doing for a hundred years with the help of activists and, and organizations that have their back and, and collaborate with them. Teenage girls are an incredibly powerful force in advocating for their lives and for for social good and at the same time question question where the research is coming from you know where where corporate funded research is coming from the doctor who was providing the radium company with research that said radium was not harmful was also doing research for big tobacco, was also doing research for um, leaded gasoline, which at the time was poisoning workers as well in the 1920s. And, and, um, and just, and look, and, you know, the last thing I'll say is that the radium girls didn't, may not have known the impact that they had during their own time. Mm -hmm. But they did leave us a record, and there is a huge collection at the Library of Congress that's open to anyone that contains the transcripts, the letters, the notes with the radium officials that, that contains the record of, of the corruption and the cover-up and the playbook. And, and, you know, they got it on the record when they brought that case. And, you know, it may be the playbook that has been used for a hundred years in a variety of industries to silence workers and to endanger them and to discredit those who speak out. But that playbook is right there for us to look at, and and you know we can we can see it when it's happening. Yeah, and and if we know what they're doing and how they're doing it, it's it's easier to to counter it. It's easier easier to, you know, we don't have to go into this unarmed. We can go in with some armed with some knowledge. Okay. Exactly. So uh, mm -hmm. what do you hope, or sorry, um, so how can people watch this movie? It's, uh, how, if our listeners want to watch it, how, what, do they, what do they do? Well, we are available on most of the um, transactional platforms right now, whether it's iTunes, um, Amazon, Prime Video, Google Play, Vudu. Um, on November uh, 15th, we'll be available on Netflix. Um, so we hope everybody can find us and watch the movie and, um, we're excited to be engaging with, um, everybody about the, about the ideas and the themes in the film. All right. All right that's great. Oh, you said November 15th. Do you mean January? No, Jan January 15th for Netflix, but right now we're available on Amazon Prime and, um, Apple TV and iTunes. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you, folks, for listening. And I, you know, I kind of got a thrill in the interviewing uh, big time Hollywood. Well, not Hollywood, but big time uh, independent movie directors for the show. And that's one of the pleasures of doing this show is being being able to interview a lot of really cool people. And you could tell that they they really cared about the subject when they made this movie. Um, and so I'd, I'd recommend watching it and just uh, keeping in mind that the, the Radium Girls uh, fought some battles that are, are they're fighting those battles still benefit us today, even though Radium itself wasn't outlawed until the mid-70s. They, they kept using it, but uh, event, eventually 
you know, they, the girls got everything they wanted, which was a, not just some health care for themselves because they were having these terrible health problems, but also uh, the eventual closure of the radium industry, which was healthy, which is good for the rest of us. Okay, and so now, uh, something that's good for the show, on to our uh, sponsors and patrons. Four Green Future is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, and provide engaging programming that teaches people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead us on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every single day of the year, which means uh, today you could actually get out and go to Wood County Park today. If you want to find out what they're doing, uh, if you want more information, you can call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. They have a website which has... uh, a lot of cool stuff on it, which is wcparks.org. And uh, they have an even cooler app, which you go to uh, any app store and search for WC Parks. And, of course, they're also on Facebook and other social media platforms. That's the Wood County Park District. And we are also brought to you by our patrons. And patrons are people who've gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And then they searched for For a Green Future, and our page popped up there. And there's some uh, some nice pictures at the different levels that you can uh, join at. And they chose the level that was uh, suitable to their budget. And every month, painlessly, a little bit comes out of their checking account and comes over to us. And that's uh, what allows us to keep bringing the, you this show every week. And uh, I think... You know, it's a good show. I think it's a valuable show because we do talk about stuff that nobody else talks about. And uh, and one of those things might be, we might be talking about that very shortly with my co-host, Rebecca. Rebecca Wood, have you joined us? I have. Yay. And uh, I have a correction from last week, by the way, when we can work it in. Ooh, well, or two weeks ago. Now. Sure, let's bet you, okay. since you work. Yeah. Remember... We were talking about poinsettias and how their uh, Nahuatl name uh, is a Quetla Zochitl, and Zochitl means flower. Well, um, I found out that Quetla actually means in the Nahuatl language, well, poop. Um, <laughs> the Aztecs were, had a very favorable opinion of poop. It, it made things grow. They thought that was great. So their, their king, you know, their emperor was actually, one of his nicknames was the Poop Lord, and they referred to comets as, uh, as star poop. And, <laughs> and that's why those little sort of blobby caterpillars that they like to eat were also called, well, turds. <laughs> right. So, so if, if you know, <laughs> an Aztec calls you a poop head, that's actually a compliment then. Yes, totally. Okay. Yeah. Right. So now okay. we know. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for that correction. A little translation trouble there. All right. America needs okay, to know. Well, <laughs> But but I, I think you have a another holiday ish kind of thing to talk about, don't you? I do, I do. I want to talk about reindeer, and uh, you know, so I looked them up, and I immediately discovered that uh, they're the same thing as caribou, which made me feel stupid. Um, <laughs> they're just what people in the new world call call reindeer. So yeah, caribou apparently in the in the native language of Alaska means uh, one who paws, which. So they're just basically diggers. They're called diggers because a major part of the caribou lifestyle, it turns out, is uh, digging up lichens out from under snow and ice. This is why, for example, you know, they they can smell uh, lichens from five feet under snow, and they have these big sort of wide shovel feet, which they use to dig and also to swim with. Because if, if, if you are a, uh, oh, and four-chambered stomach so they can process them because lichens are kind of on the tough side. So, yeah, for it, it's rather as if, you know, imagine that for you the world was covered in meatloaf and all you had to do was walk around and, you know, eat it, <laughs> basically. Um, 
Also, why they have uh, they have hair on their noses because they spend a lot of time sticking their noses down in snow to get the lichens. When you you know, we all know they're domesticated in Europe and stuff. Uh, apparently, the, the connection with uh, Santa Claus and with the solstice has something to do with. There's this ancient legend about somebody called the Deer Mother in Northern Europe, flying in Finland, flying over through the sky at, during the solstice time, and. Something so really they, they they don't just serve Santa Claus they kind of are the original Santa Claus actually they also Wait, so, they, they, their nose so, so Santa basically took the raids away from uh, another mythical figure called the Deer Mother yeah yeah this oh, I just saw a passing reference to this but there's also there's a thing in Hungarian I believe mythology where they believe they're descended from a deer. You know, people uh, get really emotionally attached to things that keep them alive, you know, <laughs> like deer. <laughs> so they're like, oh, yeah. if you see a deer and you're like, yo, yay, we're not going to, we're all going to live through the winter now, then you're going to like deer a lot, you know? So, yeah, um, they also, <clears throat> sorry, if, if you, if you look up, um, reindeer or caribou, you immediately get deluged by adaptations which they have to cold. They are super duper a- adapted to cold. Um, the one thing, you know, they, you notice they, they look kind of more kind of squat and powerful if you look at a picture of one and, you know, not all sort of pretty and graceful like ballet dancers like other deer because they need to have really compact surface so that they're not losing a lot of heat. Uh, they're, they're, they're all, they're, they're completely covered with hair from their toes to their noses. So, uh, you know, all those pictures you see, the, like funny videos of deers getting into houses and things and, you know, skittering around and falling down on tile and hardwood floors. Well, that would not be a problem if a caribou got into your house because the, uh, the, the hair on its hooves, uh, acts as traction. Um, I should probably mention that there are a few other reasons, even though that won't be an issue, why you should not invite a reindeer into your house. Well, they're kind of good as livestock, but they do not make good pets, one hears. So <laughs> keep them out of doors. They have extra chambers in their nose to warm up the air before it gets to their lungs and does damage there. Um, so, yeah, you know, generally speaking, Rudolph's nose was actually kind of magical. <laughs> it may not have closed uh-huh. bread, but it did a lot for Rudolph. It uh, kept it, it stayed warm when he could just digging up lichens and all that stuff. and protected his lungs. They also have a special coat. The, their fur is specially made with hollow hairs so that a caribou can lie down in snow and just have a little nap for itself and uh, not get wet at all because it it's so well insulated it doesn't melt the snow underneath it. Um, generally speaking, they're circumpolar. Um, there's sedentary, even domesticated populations of reindeer herds, I guess you would call those. Um, but yeah, they, uh, they tend to, the migratory ones tend to spend, spend the, um, the winters down in the taiga or the snow forest, uh, sort of subpolar, and then they migrate up to the Arctic Ocean, uh, Ar- Arctic Ocean coast to calve to have their babies is basically what happens. Um, if you ever want to know more about the, uh, the relationship between caribou wolves and, and uh, native hunters, uh, a good place to look is a book ball by Farley Mowat called See, There's Never Cry Wolf and People of the Deer. And uh, one of the things, he, you know, in, in uh, Never Cry Wolf, he gets sent up there to, by the Canadian government to find out if, the oh, those bad wolves are killing off all the all the caribou, so there's not enough for hunters. Hunters need to have the caribou. And he goes up there, and it turns out, no, the the uh, the mighty noble wolves he's he's studying are uh, basically living on bunnies and and rodents, <laughs> with the, the occasionally very weak or sick caribou calf. That's about all they can manage. Well, and there, there's a uh, it's a fantastic know, movie. This show also, is uh, aired right. live on Sunday mornings on uh, WTOD 106.5 FM in Toledo. And then I, I take that recording and use it to make my podcast and my YouTube videos. Uh, unfortunately, the recording is missing almost 20 minutes. The next 20 minutes of a fabulous, fun-filled show uh, did not get recorded. And so um, I'm finding that I have to break in here and sort of fill in that those blanks because uh, – I, the show is an hour-long show, and it, it airs on WGRN in Columbus, and I need to fill that whole hour. 
So what I will do is, going from my notes that I used before the show, uh, just give you the updates and so forth that we covered uh, in the program. And uh, I don't know, unfortunately I'm recording this on New Year's Eve. The radio station is closed. There's no one I can call or talk to to see uh, about what how, how to get back all that lost time. And so uh, I guess what we'll just do is we'll just press on here. So uh, the next portion of the show, after we talked a little bit more about Never Cry Wolf, and I just want to go back and, and again reiterate, that's a great movie. If you can get your, a copy of that, if you can get your hands on that movie, uh, I recommend watching it. There's this uh, really funny scene where the, the hero uh, is essentially living off of mice. <laughs> And he does this in order to prove that a, a large animal, uh, like a wolf or a human, because we do actually weigh about the same, uh, can survive just on a diet of, of mice and, and small rodents. And so uh, it's a pretty funny scene. I, I, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but uh, the, the reaction of the, the Native uh, Americans who live in that region when they find out he's living on on uh, just on eating mice is kind of is classic actually so uh but on to news and eco news and information so the first thing i want to cover is uh, a legislative update and uh, the uh, year had ended for the ohio legislature and they uh did two they didn't do two bad things and or they didn't do two really bad things and they just let stand the really really bad thing that was already there uh, so specifically we've been following a whole bunch of of uh, bills going through the congress or through the ohio state legislature and they do that on purpose they toss a bunch of bills in so it's hard to follow them all but uh, one of the worst ones was hb 104 and that was the bill that would have turned Ohio into a nuclear waste dump. And it it uh, created an authority, quote unquote, an authority that was uh, made up of nuclear power industry insiders. And this authority literally answered to no one, not the governor, not the not the state legislature. They were they were their own supreme authority to do whatever they wanted in terms of nuclear waste disposal or or eminent domain or you know they literally it was a bill to turn Ohio into a nuclear waste dump that bill did not pass it did, was not brought up before the Senate it had passed the house already but uh, there was a, a large outcry about 104 and they simply didn't pass it although they dangled the threat of passing it right up literally till the closing gavel of the uh, of the legislature uh, House bill 798 which is the fake repeal House, House Bill 6 bill, uh, the bill that all it did was push the uh, push the charges back another year. And uh, the one good thing that that bill did do is it did eliminate decoupling. And decoupling is uh, simply the idea that now you have to pay for your wasteful neighbor's electricity. Because uh, what this what it means is that they decouple your electrical charges from the amount of electricity that you actually use. And so everybody in every class of customer pays the same rate, regardless of, of the, whether they waste tons of money or, uh, or try to conserve tons of money. And the argument for decoupling, it was what it first was proposed about 10 years ago, was that it removed the disincentive for utility companies to encourage conservation because the idea was utility companies uh, charge by the kilowatt hour so if if somebody conserves that means less profit for the utility company and so they the argument was they don't have any incentive to help people save well if you get rid of the per kilowatt hour charge though now the individual customer has no economic incentive to save in, or to even start uh, trying to conserve energy in the first place because it doesn't matter how much they use and so it has been a, a failure wherever it's been tried in, in Hawaii or other places the studies are pretty clear 
electric usage goes up. It doesn't matter. Uh, and funny that utilities never get around to really helping people conserve. They never really get serious about their conservation programs because they still cost them money, even though they don't. Uh, it doesn't reduce their profit anymore. So uh, the excuse for decoupling is no longer even used. Now it's just the the utility companies say we want decoupling, and the and the bought and paid for legislature saying, okay, you can have decoupling. So that was repealed in 798. That was the one good thing in 798. But 798 also didn't get voted on. It was not brought up before the legislature. And so that leaves House Bill 6, the, the horrible, evil House Bill 6, leaves it completely intact. And it was set to go into effect well, it is going into effect. It is uh, going into effect tomorrow for me, January 1st. Uh, but there was a, a stay of execution, so to speak. There was a, a uh, Cincinnati and Columbus went to court and said, you know, we need a temporary injunction. We can't, our city should not be charging people the fee in House Bill 6 that goes to bail out the nukes and the and the coal plants because uh, it's unconstitutional. And uh, so the judge granted the temporary stay. So the fees are postponed. Uh, it's a temporary injunction. They're going to come back in March and actually hear the hearing on it. But from January to March anyway, you won't be charged the extra House Bill 6 charge. But every, all the other horrible House Bill 6 stuff does go into effect. It you know, eliminates the conservation program, eliminates all the support for wind and solar, creates decoupling, you know, that we just went over, and uh, and just, oh, it's just chock full of evil. And uh, so House Bill 6, the chock full of evil, evil bill, does go into effect January 1st, uh, but you won't see the charges on your bill because it's been, there's been a temporary stay. All right, then on to the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Uh, Trump, in the last days of his administration, has decided to open the Arctic Wildlife Refuge up to oil and gas exploration. Uh, this is a horrible thing. We've had uh, guests on before talking about protecting Anwar, but at this point, the Trump administration is is pushing full speed ahead, and they're trying to get leases signed and things and things committed before uh, the Trump administration has to leave office and. and Biden takes over. So uh, we'll see if there, there's any success at that. <sighs> okay, NASA has released a report. They're saying 2020 was the hottest year on record. And it's a pretty terrible record for us to have. It's not a record we want to keep breaking. Now, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they're claiming it's only the second hottest on record. But the difference is that NASA has access to temperature changes at the poles because their satellites can measure temperature changes over the whole globe. Well, NOAA, NOAA's, uh, don't record temperature changes at the poles, which all the global warming predictions are that's where the greatest changes are going to be. And so to leave those out really skews the data, kind of going back to the beginning of the show, kind of the same way if you don't know how many tuna there are, you really don't have any idea what the population numbers are, are doing based on what you're allowing. So by not measuring the, the temperature changes at the poles, NOAA's uh, global warming F estimates are going to be way off. So, uh, so there's another, <laughs> another first for 2020. The, the globe got hotter than it has ever gotten before in human history. And I'd like to follow that up with a little bit of good news. Uh, I've reported before about the Nabarima, the super tanker with 1.5 million barrels of oil that was threatening to wipe out the Caribbean Ocean. Well, uh, a reliable report from Bloomberg, even though they still are quoting anonymous uh, government sources, say that Argentina has actually begun emptying the Nabarima 
and taking that oil and they're going to put it onto other storage ships that are not uh, listing and getting ready to sink into the ocean. So that's a good news that that's avoiding the destruction of the uh, probably the entire Caribbean because uh, that amount of oil would just destroy every shoreline in the whole region. So uh, some good news there. Another disaster averted. All right. Well, uh, without Rebecca's witty banter, this is actually zipping along a little too quickly. I am I'm trying to uh, extend things out to get to follow my whole time here. But uh, one thing that I'm able to tell you now is it's time I can give you the the very last letter from the future that I'm going to receive. And uh, as you know, every week for the past two years. There's been a flash of photons next to my bed as I get up in the morning, getting ready to do the show, and there's this letter from the future from my great-great-granddaughter writing from the year 2300. And uh, unfortunately, she has to stop because apparently if you send too much information back into the past from the future, then you you can uh, wreck both the past and the future. So uh, she's thinking of our safety, even though we've loved her letters. So... Here's the last one. Dear great-great-grandfather, well, here we are with my last letter to you. I wish I could tell you all the things that I know are going to happen to you and the people of your time. The physicists who helped me create these letters to you say that I can tell you things you already know, so I can safely say that there are some hard times ahead, but things will get better if you and the other people of your time who understand the importance of saving the Earth's ecosystem and above all, preserving its wildness, stay firm and don't give up. I know because I'm living in that green future, and one thing these letters have done is make me grateful to those in your time who fought to make this possible. Another thing I'm grateful for is that Michael and I are finally married. At the last minute, the Pope herself offered to do the service via hologram, and we let her. Almost a billion people watched, Unfortunately, we aren't able to go on a honeymoon right now. There's just too much work to do. So our honeymoon consisted of carrying our, our few boxes of stuff from our individual quarters into a couple's quarters. The reception was amazing, with scientists from all over the world leading choruses of wedding songs from their home nations one after another. The partying went on until 2 a.m., and with Christmas just three days later, things are only now settling back to normal. Good luck, GGG. Remember, even if I can't write anymore, know that there's someone in the future thinking of you. Love, Marie I. So we're going to miss those letters in the future, but uh, at least we had them. <laughs> so one more thing I wanted to talk about on this week's show, and that is uh, some news. There was an article in physics or phys phys.org and it was on uh, December 24th the, the title is landmark climate policy faces growing claims of environmental racism and what this is talking about is cap and trade now cap and trade was this uh, idea that was promoted started about 20 years ago they were promoting it and the idea is that you uh, take a pollutant, any pollutant, but specifically carbon dioxide, and you set a limit on how much that you get to produce, an overall limit, and you give the people that are already doing this pollution, you give them a certain number of credits that allow them to, to make the pollution. So like, uh, let's say you have a coal company, a coal plant that's going along, putting tons of of CO2 in the air, you can say, okay, coal plant, you get uh, 10 million coal CO2 credits. And the idea is you give everybody who's polluting these credits, and then you slowly ramp down the total number that you're allowed to sell, or that you're, that you're allowed to produce. And the theory, <laughs> the brilliant theory was this would create a market, another market theory based uh, scheme and people would trade the credits back and forth to allow them to keep polluting 
And so the value of the credits would keep going up, and so it would keep getting more and more expensive to keep polluting. And so eventually the polluters would just stop and, and say, you know what, I guess we'll go ahead and put in some pollution control equipment after all. Well, uh, it's pretty clear based on California's experience that it doesn't work. What happens is, and you know, when it first started, everybody was all gung-ho and like, oh, let's buy credits. And so you had this weird situation where like high school environmental groups were paying uh, the Koch brothers for some of their uh, carbon dioxide credits and the idea was that they would retire the credits and so that carbon would never get put into the air. Well what ended up happening is that the most polluting businesses and companies simply bought credits from everybody else and the price of the credits never went up because uh, one thing markets are certainly subject to is manipulation and since the trading was all being done between all these polluting industries, they just sort of got together and said, you know, let's just sort of keep the price down. And so the, the cost never went up. And so it became much cheaper to simply buy credits than to uh, stop polluting or, or to put in pollution control equipment. And what happened is in the areas with the dirtiest plants, the air actually got worse because now they were able to buy more credits and put more pollution into the air than before and those almost all happen to be in areas that have uh, minority populations poor disenfranchised people who can't afford to live anywhere except next to a refinery or a coal plant and the air quality for those people actually got worse and also they bought ahead so they you know new credits were issued every year so they would bank them up and they would buy them from other people and they would store them. And so pretty soon the dirtiest plants were able to just sort of sit on their credits and ha be able to put as much carbon as they wanted into the air for the next 10 or 15 years. So uh, it's a big failure. What works and what has worked over and over again is just direct regulation. That is the government simply saying, okay, you can't emit any more than this, and you have to wind it down and not emit anything by this date, and we're going to enforce it. We're going to measure it and enforce it. And that actually works. <laughs> that works. That's worked with many, many different kinds of toxic pollution. It's the reason our rivers no longer catch fire. It's the reason people aren't, well, aren't dropping dead in the streets the way they do in some other places like Mumbai and, and cities of that sort. So uh, cap and trade was a gimmick from the beginning and you know a lot of us environmentalists realized that and said that but it was being pushed by some pretty big names like Al Gore was was really big on on a cap and trade but uh, you know 20 years later looking back analyzing it it's a failure. Okay well that covers all my notes from what we talked about. Of course, without Rebecca here, the, the wittiness <laughs> level drops considerably. But uh, it is New Year's Eve, and so I guess I'll take the last few minutes we've got here to just say a little bit about 2020 and some hopes for 2021. And one good thing about 2020 is a lot of the worst things that were attempted were actually blocked, either in the courts or in the case of House Bill 104 in the legislatures. A lot of the very worst things were, were blocked. Unfortunately, a lot of the really bad things went ahead, like delisting wolves as endangered species. The, the, the basic line is, the basic thing I want to convey is don't give up. 2021 is going to be better if we all fight to save the earth and the environment and don't give up. So that's Joe Damar. Thanks very much. And I'll go back to the recording for the last 30 seconds or so. Well, yep. I, I guess that's it for this week, Rebecca. It's been a pleasure as yes, always. Yes, it is. All right. Yes. So this is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. Won't no more oil for blood. The sun. But that black demon oil's got us 
fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes. 